Welcome all. It's been four days now that a group of Azerbaijani protesters have been blocking the only route between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. This morning, the state minister of Nagorno-Karabakh, Ruben Vartanian, announced that the gas supply to Nagorno-Karabakh has been restored and that he expects the corridor to be reopened today. To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Chatham House Fellow, Dr. Lawrence Bros. So Dr. Lawrence Bruce, thank you very much again for your time. Thank you. You will remember well that the route between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh was cut off previously earlier this month, but only for a few hours. This time it lasted far longer. Uh, in one of your tweets from a few days ago, you wrote something rather interesting. Um, you mentioned uh, something about the borderization theater, uh, which you said was coined by Jared Toll and Gela Merabishvili. Um, what is a borderization theater and how is that relevant to what's going on in the Lachin Corridor? Right, well, a borderization theater uh, is a term, as you mentioned, um, coined by Gerard Toll uh, and Gela Merabishvili in an article in the journal that I edit, Caucus of Survey, uh, in the context of the uh, boundary lines between uh, South Ossetia, Tsin Valley region, and uh, mainland uh, Georgia. Um, and it refers to this process, first of all, of borderization, of uh, making a de facto or contested borderline, uh, an international border, uh, which is what has been happening uh, with these borderlines around uh, South Ossetia uh, and, and Abkhazia, and particularly using this process or using this site the location of these contested borders as a kind of a theatrical stage for a kind of geopolitical performance that uh, advances a certain understanding uh, and uh, advances certain geopolitical uh, agendas. So why is this relevant uh, to the Lachin Corridor? Um, I think what we've been seeing over the past four days is a kind of a, a spectacle that has been organized and orchestrated in order to make a number of geopolitical points. First of all, uh, I think this has been directed, uh, I'm not sure whether this is first and foremost, but certainly it's a key message uh, directed at the Russian peacekeeping mission um, to basically uh, highlight their presence as something abnormal, as something temporary, and as something that Azerbaijan doesn't want. And I think, you know, the, the concentration of media presence of journalists, of scuffles between Azerbaijani journalists and the peacekeepers is all about making this point. Secondly, I think uh, the message is directed, of course, uh, at Karabakh Armenians. It is a reminder of the enclave geography of Nagorno-Karabakh and essentially of the unviability of uh, a separation of a secession uh, of Karabakh from mainland uh, Azerbaijan. And thirdly, it's, uh, I think, advancing this geopolitical agenda around corridors. You know, there's been so much discussion about the uh, Zangazur Corridor, as Azerbaijan likes to call it, this route going across uh, southern Armenia and the Lachin Corridor. The Azerbaijani perspective is that, you know, Azerbaijan has agreed to this corridor connecting Karabakh uh, and Armenia. Therefore, in a quid pro quo, there should be uh, this reciprocal corridor uh, across southern Armenia. And so I think th this concentration of, of protesters is making all of these points, but it's doing so in a way that uh, mobilizes a civil society modus operandi. You know, these are ostensibly civil society protesters, environmentalists. Uh, I don't think anybody believes that. Uh, there's ample evidence uh, of, of heavy uh, state hand in this. And, and we know that you know, protests are very few and far between uh, in Azerbaijan. But that also does not exclude the fact that uh, the ex exploitation of environmental resources in Karabakh has been a concern on the Azerbaijani side for a long time. And so this is something that people are, are worried about uh, in, in Azerbaijan. So I think it's a, you know, it's a series of uh, agendas that come together in this heavily mediatized, heavily covered uh, uh, protests um, uh, on the Lachin Corridor. And it's obvious that Russia's distraction and recent failures in Ukraine have weakened its positions 
in the region and in particular in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, we saw in March how Azerbaijan broke the ceasefire in Karabakh in um, the areas of Paruch and Khramort. Uh, later in August, Azerbaijan um, again gained the towns of Aravno and Berzor in the Lachin Corridor. Uh, Russia was unable to prevent um, the bloody post-war uh, escalations between Armenia and Azerbaijan in September of this year. Given all of this, uh, to what extent uh, can the Russian peacekeepers be able uh, to provide security guarantees to the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh? Well, uh, as, you, as you've highlighted in, in your question, I think that capacity uh, to offer effective, credible security guarantees has been massively depleted and diminished uh, because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, you know, what, what we've got in the South Caucasus now, I think is a very dangerous security vacuum uh, that, you know, is, is very much uh, a product uh, of Russia's overextension uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, it's depletion in terms of its material capacities to maintain a physical presence. But I think much more important than that is the uh, uh, decline in perceptions. It's the symbolic capital, if you will, uh, of, uh, of Russian security guarantees. You know, somebody said to me in a meeting uh, some months ago uh, that the Russian security guarantees, the power of those guarantees lies not so much in force deployment, but in the symbol of the Russian flag. Now that symbolic uh, capital, as I said, has uh, declined dramatically. And we've seen Azerbaijan testing uh, the testing uh, Russian capacity. Um, and I think to understand that, you know, we have to, to go back to the ceasefire uh, agreement of November, 2020, and what that situation was and what that represented. Azerbaijan was within a hair's breadth of resolving this conflict on its terms uh, once and for all. I think that's a, a common Azerbaijani perception. But Azerbaijan was forced to accept a conflict termination process on Russia's terms. Um, now, in the short term, I think uh, the winning back of the occupied territories and particularly of Shusha kind of compensated for that. Over the longer term, I think the payback was supposed to be, you know, access to these corridors, to these transit routes, um, and the, the signing of an agreement. And, and those outcomes haven't happened. So Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I think, has offered Azerbaijan uh, an opportunity to really challenge this uh, Russian-framed uh, uh, status quo uh, in, in Karabakh. And we're seeing that happen in different ways. You've mentioned the escalations in March and in August, testing, uh, you know, basically showing that uh, the Russian peacekeeping mission isn't capable of uh, offering security uh, to the Karabakh Armini population. And I think over the past few days, you know, a different kind of wearing down of the peacekeepers' legitimacy by basically framing them as the obstacle to Azerbaijani citizens' legitimate access uh, to. To, to sovereign Azerbaijani territory uh, as Azerbaijani see it. So um, yeah, I think this has been a kind of a key message. It's been very noticeable how on a number of government associated social media accounts, uh, it is Russia uh, and the Russian peacekeeping force uh, that has been foregrounded uh, in accounts of what has been happening. So I think you know what, what we're looking at is a sort of a gradual process of discrediting, delegitimating, uh, the peacekeeping mission so that, you know, if we come to 2025, um, that uh, a non-renewal of their mandate uh, wouldn't be actually that controversial uh, or surprising. We've been hearing talk on the Armenian side about moving the peacekeeper presence from a solely Russian one to a more international one. Theoretically, do you think that any Western country or any other country for that matter would be ready to deploy peacekeepers to the region? Uh, I think the answer at present uh, to that question is probably negative. 
Um, I mean, in different discussions that I've participated in over the years about uh, peacekeeping uh, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, one of the, the messages has been that outside powers, uh, with the exception of, of, of Russia, perhaps, outside powers would be willing to dedicate resources and manpower to peacekeeping with a very clearly defined exit strategy. So that means really uh, that peace, peacekeepers would be deployed if there is a functioning uh, peace process that would deliver a robust agreement within uh, a foreseeable time frame that would render the peacekeeping presence uh, unnecessary. Um, so the question is, I think, you know, uh, it, it's a huge risk uh, to, to dedicate peacekeepers. And I think what every, every country wants to avoid is an indefinite deployment uh, or a deployment without, uh, you know, a clear exit strategy. I think Russia is different. Uh, there's a, you know, a big literature on, on Russia's use of peacekeeping missions as a rather different sort of mechanism, uh, basically in order to, to freeze a situation uh, until more favorable geopolitical winds uh, uh, prevail and basically to, to allow continued geopolitical influence uh, into a, a complex situation. So I think you know this is this is the Azerbaijani worry um, that you know uh, Nagorno-Karabakh may become you know much more like South Ossetia. Uh, I think that's been a worry from the moment that the ceasefire statement was signed uh, on 9th of November 2020. And so, as you mentioned, there has been discussion of possibilities. Uh, there's been analysis, for example, uh, from Benjamin Porosian. Uh, discussing the UNAMIG, uh, the, the United Nations mission to, to in Abkhazia, uh, as a kind of a variant where you have basically a, a Russian staffed peacekeeping mission, but with additional international uh, observers. So, you know, I don't know whether at some future point there might be uh, a convergence of interest between Azerbaijan. Uh, Karabakh Armenians, Russians, and uh, some other countries to, to arrive at some kind of a compromise. Um, I think uh, certainly in the, it's hard to see in the short term. I think Azerbaijan is very much focused uh, on, on removing a, a peacekeeper presence. But the dilemma then is then how do you provide security? Uh, or how do you prevent a, a mass exodus uh, a resolution of this in terms of ethnic cleansing. And I think this is the, the kind of the holy grail and the elephant in the room is how do we arrive at a less securitized relationship between the Azerbaijani state and the Karabakh Armenian population? How can you do that without direct dialogue, without direct talks? This has been articulated, including uh, by Azerbaijani analysts, as a great article uh, by Shujat Ahmed Zadeh, published by the Top Center, that looks at how this might happen. You know, I think you know that would be a positive direction uh, for that discussion to go in, but that's impossible uh, in such uh, securitized and, and a very tense environment, such as the one created over the past four days. Finally, Lawrence, I just want to say that there is this other narrative that Moscow and Baku must have been in cahoots to make this happen. Uh, many analysts, as you mentioned, believe that this is a lot to do with the Zangezur, the so-called Zangezur corridor. Um, and many believe that Russia too wants the Zangezur corridor to be open for its own interests. Um, many analysts would say that Russia would take significant control over the route and that Moscow's role could be more calculated than one might think. Um, why would they maneuver in this way? What do you think about this narrative? I'm sure you've heard of it. Yeah, I mean, I think the narrative does hit on something that is undeniably uh, true. If this transit route uh, across uh, Southern Armenia does materialize as a kind of a corridor, as per the terms of the ceasefire statement, it would be the Russian border service that would be in control of that route. And so then you'd have a situation where Russia would basically be in charge and controlling these two crucial corridors uh, in the South Caucasus. And in the context of Russia's otherwise declining levers and declining influence uh, proceeding uh, from uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, although I would argue that actually Russian influence in the South Caucasus has been declining for a much longer period than that. It's simply been accelerated uh, by the invasion of Ukraine. This would be a way to reassert uh, a Russian presence. And 
when, when we look at the post-Ukraine uh, geopolitical horizon for Russia in the South Caucasus, probably a kind of securitized connectivity is the best case scenario. Uh, so I think you know, that narrative does hit on, on that, that reality. On the other hand, uh, I think there's always a tendency to see a Russian hand, a hidden hand in everything, and to assume far more coordination and kind of backstage maneuvering and sort of you know puppeteering uh, than is actually the case. Um, <clears throat> you know, Russia, uh, uh, I think, has potentially more levers of influence in the South Caucasus than any other out outside power, but it doesn't have a strategic or coherent approach to, to what it wants. Um, you know, we see that, for example, uh, in its, you know, attempt to have both a regional policy and its patronage of specific actors uh, within the region. These are two strategies that basically cancel each other out. So I very much doubt that uh, Russia would accede or agree to or, or kind of be, you know, maneuvering in, uh, in the back room uh, for situations that really uh, subject its, its peacekeeping mission to a kind of de delegitimation. Um, yes, it would benefit if this Zangazur corridor notion becomes a reality in the terms imagined uh, in the uh, uh, ceasefire statement. Um, but I, I don't think that Azerbaijan is coordinating these actions uh, uh, with Russia. Uh, Azerbaijan has, you know, I think it has uh, the capacity to be testing Russia um, in, in these ways uh, rather than uh, coordinating with it. So, so yeah. Uh, okay. Well, Dr. Lawrence Burrs, I really appreciate it. Thank you again for your time. Thanks very much, Emilio. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet.